and uh, welcome Fred on stage. Um, really you. a pleasure to have you here. Um, we got to know each other about um, more than one year ago when you moved to Berlin. You were one of the first DevOps hires um, over at OneFootball before you spent most of your career crafting your skills in different IT positions back in Brazil. And um, maybe for the people who don't know OneFootball yet, um, could you elaborate a bit? What does the company do for which you took all this way and actually moved to Berlin? Sure. So if you are a football fan, you should have one football installed in your cell phone. So uh, if you have a favorite team, if you have a national team or a favorite player like Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, Neymar, all these guys, you can follow them uh, inside the app and we will make sure you will receive all the scores, all the matches, and all specific news, uh, especially for your profile. And yeah, it's a great app. If you don't have, please download it. I can only support that. And I think the 20 million plus users um, you have all over the world support that case. Now, our title for today's interview already gives away the happy ending, but I think the story you took there is, uh, the journey you took there is a really interesting story. So, um, in terms of that, when you started uh, at One Football, what was the technology stack like, and what were the challenges you saw actually in order to prepare for the biggest event in the company's history, uh, the World Cup we had this year? Yeah, so basically uh, the stack before was uh, based on uh, normal EC2 servers. Uh, the provisioning was being made using uh, provisioning tools like SaltStack, Chef, uh, some Ansible, a little bit of Terraform. And we had uh, also MariaDB uh, databases and some Elastic Cache on using Redis mostly. And uh, because of this stack, and also the EC2 servers were FreeBSD outdated, so kind of a tricky setup to work with. So you can imagine that in, during a match day, uh, we needed to scale up, let's say, Barcelona and Real Madrid, and then the users coming, and you needed to scale up like this, and salt stack and chef provisioning EC2, deploying the EC2 before it came up, and sometimes with some bugs, so you can imagine that this uh, represented a lot of instabilities for us. And also we have a newsroom team, and they are, uh, they are always writing articles. Uh, so the news that you receive, we actually have a newsroom uh, working uh, to do this news. And they were using WordPress. And WordPress was uh, one inst a single instance installation with everything inside. So how to scale? Uh, so that, that was the biggest challenges we, we faced at that time. Also, monitoring, uh, we've been using Nagios and just CloudWatch, simple metrics from EC2, RDS. So uh, really difficult set, set up to see what was really happening under the hood. I, I figured that. Thank you for the comprehensive view. Um, I see that you had kind of like two main challenges behind that. So on one hand, you really had an infrastructure which didn't really service your software very well, so your customers were happy. And also, it seems like with all this tool stack and your monitoring in place, stuff went wrong, but you didn't really know why you got bad feedback or stuff like this. Um, now, I know how you solved the first challenge as I accompanied the whole process and you uh, solved that challenge by migrating to Kubernetes. I think Kubernetes is a very interesting technology and I think your process you underwent was very interesting. So maybe you could um, elaborate a bit what were the deciding factors to migrate to Kubernetes when you guys were looking for a more efficient and effective infrastructure model. Yeah, so uh, basically uh, we were split between all these tools to deploy and to provisioning EC2. So you can imagine that our uh, continuous delivery process was not uh, actually doing well. And we wanted to have a reliable uh, CI CD solution. And also we wanted to have a more stable environment uh, during big matches or breaking news. So we came up uh, with the idea uh, from ch choosing from the migration of a uh, specific, I guess it's my cell phone or yours. <laughs> so we came up with the idea to uh, migrate one of the new applications because some of the applications were running with PHP and we were migrating to Golang. And we needed to put it to production. So me and 
uh, one of the backend uh, developers. We sit down in my very first week, we build a new Kubernetes cluster, uh, we did a CD uh, pipeline, and we could deploy this new uh, API. In, by the end of the week, it was in production already. And yeah, it was like the first beginning of the Kubernetes cluster in one football. Yeah. Um, well, I, I know that is, it has been an interesting story and you guys had a really long journey, especially with Kubernetes. Now, um, the second challenge I know you solved even before going into the action plan of migrating to Kubernetes. So you guys moved to New Relic uh, to monitor your systems. Could you maybe elaborate a bit on what you think made it crucial to basically monitor your entire production environment which with like a really sophisticated monitoring system? Yeah, as I told, we only had uh, monitoring, basic, basic monitoring with uh, Nagios, so like uh, HTTP port is down, uh, you have 10,000 uh, messages in, in the queue, but we actually didn't know how bad the problem, this problem could be. And uh, also one of the decision points uh, happened when the WordPress, uh, this platform for our newsroom team, uh, went down and we didn't know uh, how it happened and we needed to do something. So we started to migrate it to Kubernetes and to put New Relic to see what was really happening uh, inside and we actually figured it out. It was like related to database and some other stuff, also caching and the migration to Kubernetes and with the vision of New Relic helped a lot to, to understand and to build uh, better software. Also, uh, not only with WordPress, but also with uh, our Golang applications and with the PHP applications, as you can see in this graph, uh, the migration helped a lot because we could took time, uh, we could take time to, to really look for the application and that's one of the good outcomes that I, I can mention to you. Uh, is to always take time when you are doing these migrations because if you do too quick and you are changing like to a, a docker based from a EC2 based uh, application to a docker based you need to take time to see other stuff like logging, environment configuration so during a migration take the proper time to do things properly then you have a good outcome. Well, it's always nice to hear uh, that kind of feedback from customers to us, and I think the response time we just saw on the screen uh, speak for itself. Now, you did really a lot of optimizations, mainly the Kubernetes part, then as well uh, introducing a monitoring methodology. Um, in what way did this kind of change the um, setup with, you had with AWS, the underlying infrastructure also for the Kubernetes cluster you have right now? Yeah, so it changed a lot because uh, now looking for what we really was going on inside the application, it became easy to uh, create alerting uh, inside uh, based on error rate, based on the throughput, and we actually, uh, because we had the World Cup coming, so we actually did the homework and migrated everything before the World Cup, and we could easily uh, see and create proper alerting for each uh, application. And of course, for AWS, we came from uh, 400 or five, 500 EC2 servers to now work with around 30 servers in production with this migration. So cost reduction was uh, a thing that we could achieve in the middle field. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, a lot of a lot uh, like a large part in that probably the AWS reduction and what seems to be a really great result in uh, reducing uh, a high amount of servers um, was obviously the Kubernetes migration and I think probably as you really had um, on different uh, languages on different frameworks you had the migration done and it has been successful I think you probably have some lessons to share with the audience who might uh, are ahead of a migration who plan to do it or are looking for a new infrastructure model to be more effective more cost efficient yeah so basically if you see opportunity to improve to do things right do it and take time to do and always communicate with people. Uh, one of the things that I learned is it's always better to, do, to go in person, to talk with people in person, that, rather than doing uh, by chat. 
it will save time for you, it will avoid misunderstandings, and you can easily uh, get people together because sometimes it's difficult when you have, like we work now in cross-functional teams, and uh, we should work everything, everyone inside one specific team. I'm working a platform team at One Football, but we have the news team and the scores team. So if we don't go to the specific people because if you look, all these systems, all the microservices need to communicate with each other. So we should communicate with each other the same way. So we need to go to the people and talk with people and get people sometimes together. Maybe during a coffee conversation, it's always good to interact and to change. It, it will never work if you start to work, just coming to work in your desk and do your stuff and go home and to not communicate with other people. Now. You, we talked about the two major improvements you've done ahead of the ahead of the World Cup, and I think we wrapped up together. Uh, I mean, you wrapped up with a little bit of help of our, on our end. Uh, you wrapped up the migration somewhere mid-May, so there were till, still like two months to go until the World Cup started. Um, besides the migration, what were kind of the preparations besides that you have done to really uh, be prepared for the biggest day in the company's history? Yeah, we did a lot of load tests, a lot. And New Relic helped a lot to see uh, how much traffic or how much throughput each application could handle. Also, uh, we tested each application and some cross uh, scenarios, like uh, when, like from the user's pers perspective, coming to see the news and then scrolling down to see the matches and to see what happened with the live ticker for a specific match. So we needed to do these tests, these load tests, uh, by uh, a specific scenario and crossing many different microservices. And this, uh, we, and with the vision that New Relic provided to us, it became easy to see all the bottlenecks and to work to fix all of them. Okay, well, we know how the World Cup went. We know it went way better than the German team had a World Cup. And, um, but it would be kind of interesting. You did all this preparation, I think. Uh, you guys were really ready. But what did you look out for in terms of understanding whether your customers are having a good experience, whether your applications are delivering what you are planning to deliver, and that everything is reliable, so basically one football is just going smoothly through the World Cup. What were you looking for? So uh, we've been looking for basically the response times of the applications and the throughput. Uh, but our, our alerting is based on error rate and based on AppDex. Uh, but all these metrics are really crucial, really important to us to make sure everything is uh, stable, uh, So, which is basically what uh, APM offers. So you have the response time by application, by uh, dependency you have for MySQL, for Elastic Cache, and all other stuff, as you can see again in this graph. <laughs> and it helps a lot. But I, I must say that during the World Cup, it was pretty smooth. I actually was traveling in the beginning of the World Cup <laughs> because we were confident that uh, based on the load tests and basing, uh, and looking for all the monitorings, uh, we were able to, to handle the World Cup. So it was pretty smooth. And we worked uh, doing shifts during the World Cup to make sure everything will be stable. And if something happens, uh, it, uh, at least an uh, exper experienced uh, developer will be there, but nothing happened and we were fortunate to have this uh, infrastructure working. I, I think those are some great lessons you're sharing, especially as I think your case is kind of uh, transferable to maybe e-commerce customers who are working uh, towards the biggest day, which could be Black Friday, uh, to uh, Christmas, stuff like that. Um, maybe um, you mentioned the topic of alerting, and I think it's kind of interesting you're having those uh, metrics, which are highly important to understand whether your customers are having good experience, whether everything's going right. How did you figure what is satisfying to your customers, maybe in terms of threshold, maybe in terms of baseline alerting? How did you kind of figure that one out? Yeah, so for uh, different types of applications, we have uh, different types of alerting and uh, thresholds. Uh, but for a baseline, we are putting like for error rate 1% for uh, warning and 2% for alerting. And for AppDex, all above, all below 95% is bad for us. So we work in a really reliable system nowadays. Seems like a good method methodology. Um, 
I know you guys made a lot of changes. You shared most of it right now uh, with the audience. Um, you were one of the first DevOps hires, and I know your organization also underwent some changes itself. Could you maybe tell a bit about how this changed over the course of the year, and uh, maybe also what kind of DevOps methodology you guys introduced in order to work more efficient and effective? Yeah, so actually my very first week, uh, the company changed the, the engineering setup, so came uh, from a uh, uh, competence uh, way of working like a DevOps team, a backend team, and a web development team to a cross-functional, so uh, focused to deliver new product, new features, but we also have something called, uh, inside the company, something called uh, the competence area owner. So this person is responsible for uh, setting uh, the technology and also best practice practices for their own competence, uh, across the teams. So this actually uh, also has uh, the value for having all this good, good structure that we have, not only in the infrastructure side, but uh, mostly in the code. Because uh, yes, we did this migration, but without the help of all engineering team, all backend developers, this never will never happen. Now, um, of obviously you know that New Relic is also striving to really help DevOps side and um, I don't know, but maybe also New Relic played some part in that kind of uh, like change in thought process, moving towards DevOps. What kind of part did New Relic take there, or did New Relic take a part? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, with all this information that we could get from New Relic, it was uh, big stuff that to see all these uh, informations and all the red dots that happened during the way to actually see where uh, the problem was and to actually take actions and fix uh, whether it is, uh, were a database issue or a cache issue, it was easy to see uh, and fix the problems. Perfect. Um, now, to wrap things up, um, you underwent a lot of changes this year, uh, basically preparing for the biggest uh, day in company's history, um, having run the World Cup, um, then optimizing after the World Cup. Now, we worked together a little bit more than a year. What would you say is the lasting impact, uh, like introducing a monitoring system, introducing monitoring workflows onto OneFootball as an organization? So basically, the number of incidents reduced a lot. This is the graph I wanted to show. You can see basically a huge drop uh, in the time frame. So something about 80% of uh, number of incidents, less incidents. And also the cost reduction that we had uh, because we before we needed to be always overscaled to handle the traffic and now uh, we don't need to be this way anymore. So with New Relic, it's easy to see if something goes wrong uh, during a scaling and a downscaling moment. And yeah, helps a lot to, to see, to really see these things. Uh, and we couldn't see this before. So um, all the team is, uh, all the, the whole team is pretty happy to have New Relic as a monitoring tool, that's for sure. I really like to hear that. Um, well. To close up on a more personal note, um, you're, as a Brazilian soccer fan, uh, maybe rate on a scale... Football, football, no soccer. <laughs> terminology issues. Um, so, um, as a Brazilian football fan, um, how happy were you? Like, scale 1 to 10 about the doom of the German national team. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty happy, come on. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. It was a Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.